Hello and welcome to the Equestrian Canada, Canada Equestrian National Health and Welfare Call. This call takes place monthly and is open to anyone in the horse industry. The call was developed to increase information sharing within the horse industry in Canada and all topics related to equine health and welfare. Please note that the call is recorded and will be posted on EC's website along with the previous calls. Links related to the call can be found at the same location. Because the call is recorded, we will hold all questions until the end, as some people are not comfortable with their questions being included in the recording. We have muted the lines to avoid background noise. If you wish to unmute to ask a question at the end of the call, please press star six. My name is Dr. Bettina Bobstein, and I'm going to proceed with our introductions. Uh, our first speaker uh, will be well known to many of you, particularly in the veterinary profession, uh, Dr. Sue Dyson. Dr. Dyson is from the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. Uh, in her career, Dr. Dyson has amassed a most impressive body of work. She is recognized as an international authority on equine lameness and diagnosis and treatment. Today, she'll be focusing on pain recognition in the ridden horse so that we might start to address the associated welfare issues. And with that, uh, I give the floor over to Dr. Sue Dyson. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very High pleasure to have the opportunity to present um, the work that we've been doing over the last several years, which is using behavioural aspects of the ridden horse to tell us that the horse may be suffering musculoskeletal discomfort. So if we have the first next slide, please. I think that uh, there's a clear body of evidence that many owners and trainers are often poor at recognising lameness. In a retrospective study of uh, more than 500 sports horses which were in normal work and presumed to be sound, 47% of them demonstrated either overt lameness or had other pain-related gait abnormalities such as a stiff and stilted canter. And it's been my observation that many problems are labelled as training-related, rider-related or behavioural, or that's just how this horse has always been or always gone. And um, as a result of that, I think that um, the significance of these behavioural signs gets overlooked. I think that many veterinarians have had uh, not a great deal of training in how to recognise low-grade lameness and a behavioural abnormalities. So through my clinical observations over many, many years, I have observed many horses which so many different behavioural manifestations, which I believe reflects musculoskeletal pain. And the reason I believe that is because if I take away their pain by doing nerve blocks, I can resolve these behaviours. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. I think you should have a grey horse, and if you don't, you need to go on to the next slide. Um, the grey horse is spooking on the left-hand side. It's throwing its head up in the air and swishing its tail. It's then going over bench in the third picture with its mouth open. And then in the fourth picture is clearly rearing. And all of these behaviours were completely abolished when its underlying pain was resolved. So we started on a journey when we began by looking at the facial expressions in ridden horses. And we started with facial expressions because there is clear data from a variety of different species, including man, that facial expressions can be used to determine the presence of pain. So we developed an ethogram, which is a catalogue of behaviours, each of which has specific definitions, um, to describe facial expressions in normal horses. And so here we see examples of horses with their head tilted to variable degrees um, and um, the ears in varial, variable positions. If we go to the next slide, we, from the original um, study, demonstrated that uh, having developed an ethogram, we could show that people from a variety of different professional backgrounds could reasonably um, accurately produce the results of the ethogram correctly, and they agreed with each other. So we knew that various different people from, with different skills could interpret the ethogram. So the next question to ask was, 
can we use this ethogram to look at facial expressions and differentiate based on facial expressions alone the presence or absence of pain? So we took multiple photographs of both lame and non-lame horses and we um, cut them so that all you could see was the head so that the assessor was not influenced by the rest of the appearance of the body of the horse. And the next slide, please. For each of the facial expressions, we assigned a pain score from between zero and three. So, for example, if you couldn't see the tongue, the score was zero. If you just saw the tip of the tongue, the score was one. But if the entire tongue was lolling out, then that was a score of three. And then we could determine a total score for each of the horse's photographs. And we found that total pain scores of the lame horses were significantly higher than those of the non-lame horses. Uh, and so here on the pictures on the left, you see a non-lame horse with its ears forward, its wide, eye wide open, its mouth shut. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see the horse with one ear um, pressed backwards. You can see tension in the muscles above the eye. And the eye has a sort of glazed expression or an intense stare. So those are the features that are abnormal in the horse on the right. So when we compared lame horses before and after eliminating their pain using nerve blocks, we saw that all the mean pain scores were um, significantly lower after we had taken away the pain, showing quite um, unequivocally that there is a causal relationship between these facial expressions and the presence of pain. If you move to the next slide, the next phase of the study was to develop a whole horse ridden ethogram and apply it to lame and non-lame horses. So for this ethogram, again, it was a series of definitions of the variety of different behaviors relating not only to the facial expressions and the position of the head and neck, but also things like tail switching, as we see in the middle horse, or moving on speed track, as we see on the chestnut horse to the right. Uh, next slide, please. We compared 13 non-lame horses with 24 lame horses. And our original ethogram comprised more than 117 behaviors, which we determined by looking at multiple videos of non-lame and lame horses. And then by application of this ethogram of 117 behaviors, we could then determine those features which were most commonly associated with pain. And after that, we reduced the ethogram to many fewer behaviors. To move to the next slide, we finished up with 24 behavioral markers, which were each 10 times more likely to be seen in a lame horse compared with a non-lame horse. And I'm going to go through these um, individually. First of all, we had a group of facial markers, and many of the markers were timed. So one of the markers was the ears lying back behind the vertical for five seconds or more. And this could be either one ear or both ears. Um, so if the horse just laid its ears back um, instantaneously following a leg age, that would not count. The ears had to be back continuously for five seconds or more. The next behavior was closure or partial closure of the eyelids for between two and five seconds. Also related to the eye was exposure of the white of the eye or the sclera. Uh, and the presence of an intense stare or glazed expression or looking zoned out for a minimum of five seconds. The mouth opening with separation of the teeth for at least 10 seconds was an important behavior. 
and appearance of the tongue either momentarily or continuously was another behavior. We have also observed that in lame horses, sometimes the bit gets pulled through the mouth onto one side, either the left or the right, and that is another of the key behaviors which we see ten times more frequently in lame horses than non-lame horses. Next slide, please. Next were the body markers, which looked at movement of the head and neck and movement of the tail. So changes that were significant related to the position of the head was repeated up and down movements of the head or the head moving from side to side or twisted from side to side. If the horse tilted its head so its pole went to one way and its nose went the other way, that was additionally a sign. If the head was in front of the vertical for more, of more than 30 degrees for at least 10 seconds, that was abnormal. The front of the head being behind the vertical for at least 10 seconds was norm abnormal. We know that the normal horse swings its tail rhythmically with the movement of the back. So abnormality is the tail being clamped tightly on the midline to the buttocks or being held continuously to one side. Also abnormal was um, repeated tail swishing movements, either up and down or side to side or in circular movements. Next slide, please. We have observed that horses can adapt to pain either by going slowly or by rushing. So we, uh, the abnormalities were either a rush gait, which was defined as a frequency of trot steps being more than 40 steps per 50 se 15 seconds, and a gait which was too slow had less than 35 trot steps per 15 seconds which often looks like a passage-like shot. The horse moving on three tracks, as we see in the photograph on the right, was another abnormal behavior. Repeated leg changes in canter or repeated incorrect strike-offs were also deemed to be abnormal. And then we had spontaneous changes of gait. For example, the horse breaking from canter to trot or from trot to canter. Next slide. If the horse tripped or stumbled repeatedly or had a hind limb toe drag, that was abnormal. Spookiness or sudden changes of direction against the horse's, against the rider's direction was abnormal. If the horse was reluctant to move forward and had to be either kicked or given verbal encouragement or urged on with a whip or spurs, or stopped spontaneously, this was another abnormal behavior. And then both rearing and bucking were abnormal. Next slide. So we compared a group of non-lame and lame horses. And when we looked at the non-lame horses, the maximum score that we saw from any horse was six out of 24 whereas the average score for the non-lame horses was only 2 out of 24. When we looked at the lame horses, the maximum score was 14 out of 24, with an average score of 9. So in the photographs at the bottom, this is an abnormal horse, which has got its tail swishing, it's uh, tilting its head, it's got one ear flat back for more than five seconds, uh, and it's opening its mouth for more than 10 seconds and has a glazed expression in the eye for more than five seconds. We can't um, really look at its straightness from these photographs particularly well. So there were significant differences in the scores of the lame horses versus the non-lame horses. And we determined from this that the detection of eight or more of the 24 behaviors is highly likely to reflect the presence of musculoskeletal pain. It's true to say that there are some horses with mild lameness or some stoical horses which score less than eight, but no sound horses score any more than six. Next slide, please. We then took this study a step further 
to compare behavior in ridden horses using this ethogram, both before and after we had taken away pain using nerve blocks. And we have an example on the right um, of the facial expression and behavior um, before analgesia on the top and after analgesia when the lady's got the blue sweater on. So we found that after resolution of lameness, there was a statistically significant reduction in the pain scores. And once again, the study provided further evidence that the presence of eight or more behavioral markers is likely to reflect the presence of pain, even if that pain is only manifest as a very low-grade lameness or performance problems, which is what this horse on the right had. This horse had problems in flying changes and canter pirouettes. Uh, next slide, please. The next phase of the study was to compare the ability of 10 non-trained assessors to apply this ethogram to 21 horses, which video footage was available before and after resolution of lameness. And the non-trained assessors were compared with a gold standard trained assessor in terms of their performance. So the objectives of the study were to compare the results of the application of the ridden horse ethogram among the uh, untrained assessors who had different professional backgrounds and between the untrained assessors and a gold standard. And we hypothesized that there would be significant reduction in the behavior scores after resolution of pain by nerve blocks determined by both the gold standard and the untrained assessors. Next slide, please. So for inclusion, the horses had to be ridden by the same person who was a professional rider, both before and after diagnostic analgesia. So different riders rode different horses, but the same horse, same person rode the same horse before and after nerve blocks. The footage had to include both working trot and working canter on both the left and right reins, and the duration of the video recordings had to be um, between three and five minutes and time matched before and after local analgesia. So the only change which took place in the horses um, was the removal of pain. Next slide. So we anonymized all the video recordings and they were numbered in a randomized order so that each horse had two numbers which reflected both before and after the nerve blocks. And to try to counteract observer bias, nine horses had randomly allocated lower numbers before the nerve blocks than after the nerve blocks, and 12 horses had higher numbers before nerve blocks compared with afterwards. The assessors were not actually informed that there were 21 horses before and after analgesia. They were just told that there were 42 recordings of non-lame and lame horses. Next slide, please. Um, so all the horses underwent comprehensive lameness evaluations, um, including nerve blocks. Uh, and any tack which may have compromised performance, for example, a saddle with tight tree points, was replaced prior to the final video recordings, and we excluded horses with oral lesions. So we can see in the photographs along the bottom, to the left, the horse has its mouth open, front of the head is behind the vertical, has an intense stare. In the middle photograph, the horse has stopped spontaneously, and it's got its mouth wide open, and it's pushing its tail. Um, and it's in the right, its ears are back, and it's continuing to switch its tail. Next slide, please. So the um, untrained assessors comprised two recent veterinary graduates, um, a junior vet who had graduated five years previously, five equine technicians, and two equine veterinary nurse, nurses. And none of these people had undergone any specialist training in equine behavior. And they had to apply the ethogram saying, yes, a behavior was present, or no, it was absent. Next slide, please. Um, so we tried to see whether our cutoff level of eight for the presence of pain was uh, accurate. So we compared the sensitivity and specificity of the ethogram for a cutoff of either six, seven, eight, or nine. And we also assessed the agreement 
between the untrained assessors and the trained assessor. And we also looked at the overall behavior scores before and after nerve blocks. Uh, next slide, please. So of our 21 horses, 19 had a low-grade unilateral or bilateral hind limb lameness, um, eight of which also had a concurrent low-grade forelimb lameness. Uh, two horses had a unilateral forelimb lameness, and one horse had uh, kissing spines or impinging spinous processes. And 16 of the horses had a component of sacroiliac joint region pain. The lameness was uh, low grade. If we score from a score of 0 to 8, the range, the horse's scores range from between 1 and 4, and the most frequent grade was only 2 out of 8. So this was low grade lameness. Next slide, please. So for the trained assessor, when they looked at the lame horses, the behavior scores ranged between 3 and 12 out of 24, with an average of 9, and the most frequent score was 10. And after nerve blocks had removed the pain, the scores dropped very significantly and ranged between 0 and 6, with an average of 3. So the difference in behavior scores between before and after the nerve blocks ranged from between 2 and 12 of the, of the behaviors, with an average of 6. Next slide, please. Um, for both the untrained and the trained assessors, we saw highly significant reductions in the behavior scores after the resolution of the lameness. So if we look at the um, graphs on the left-hand side and look at the green boxes, the green box on the left-hand side represents the range of scores before diagnostic analgesia, and the box to the right, the lower box, indicates the range of scores before after diagnostic analgesia. And this is for the results of the trained and the untrained assessors combined. And if we look at the graph on the right-hand side, we've separated out the non-trained assessors in the dark red and the dark blue, and the trained assessor in the bright red and the lighter blue. And we can see that there's good, good agreement between the two groups before diagnostic analgesia on the left, and after diagnostic analgesia, obviously they're scoring much lower, although the trained assessor has scored lower than the non-trained assessors. And we saw decreases in all of the markers, the facial markers, the body markers, and the gait markers. Next slide, please. Uh, this graph is a bit complicated because it shows all the 24 behaviors on the horizontal axis and the frequency of their occurrence on the vertical axis. And then the orange bars represent the lame horses and the blue bars represent the non-lame horses. And we can see that for the vast majority of the behaviors, we've got substantial reduction in each of the behaviors after diagnostic analgesia. The exception is behavior four, and behavior four was the front of the head going behind the vertical, because some horses which were way above the bit before um, adapted to being much more comfortable by becoming slightly behind the bit. Uh, new slide. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is looking at, to determine is eight behaviors the best behavior to have, uh, the, the best cutoff to have to determine the difference between lame and non-lame. And we're looking to see where, where the blue lines and uh, orange lines come uh, closest together combined with the highest values. And that, again, comes at this lameness threshold cutoff of eight behaviors. So that is reinforcing the fact that the cutoff of eight of the 24 behavioral markers is um, a very good indicator that we have the presence of pain. Next slide, please. So if we took this threshold of eight for the presence of pain um, and looked at the overall agreement for the 24 behaviors, it was reasonable for the lame horses. Um, uh, and when we compared the untrained assessor with the gold standard, it was moderate. 
Um, remember that for, to have complete agreement, for which we would have a what we call a flash cap of value of one, um, to get complete agreement for 24 different behaviors is, is very, very difficult. So to have a flash cap of value of 0 0.49 is very acceptable for this type of work. Um, after the nerve blocks, the agreement among the untrained assessors remained fair, but they were not um, terribly well in agreement with the gold standard. But they did show complete agreement for the absence of rearing, both before and after nerve blocks, and for the absence of bucking after nerve blocks. Next slide, please. So when we looked to see who of the untrained assessors did best, there was no doubt that the clinician with five years of experience of evaluating named horses scored closest to the trained assessor. And we were able to identify specific behaviors for which there was poor agreement. And those were the presence of an intense stare, the bit being pulled through the mouth, a rushed gait, or stumbling, chipping, or repeated toe drag. Next slide, please. So we have previously shown that uh, with the facial expression ethogram, that training improved interpretation of the ethogram, and we suspect that training also improves application of the ridden horse ethogram. So this um, uh, study verified that the presence of eight or more behavioral markers is likely to reflect musculoskeletal pain. However, there may be some overlapping scores between non-lame and lame horses who are scoring less than eight. And the substantial reduction in the behavior scores after pain resolution verifies that there is a likely causal relationship between the pain and the behavior exhibited by the horses. Next slide, please. I think it's important when we're applying the ethogram that we recognize that some horses will show very different behaviors in different gaits. So in this horse, in the left-hand picture, we see the horse in trot, and the horse looks happy, head in a nice position, swinging through its back, tail held correctly, whereas all the pictures on the right are with, are with the horse in canter. So it's overbent, it's swishing its tail, it's crooked. It's opening its mouth. It's got an intense stare. It's got its ears back um, and at times exposed the white of the eye. So we need to look at both all the paces that the horse is working in. Next slide, please. Um, and this goes back to training. We know that training can um, uh, improve interpretation of the facial expression ethogram. We've shown that the whole horse ridden ethogram is, um, has a high level of repeatability when it's applied by a trained assessor, um, which uh, gives us um, faith in how accurately this tool can be applied, assuming that you've had adequate training. Next slide, please. Um, now, obviously, the studies that I've described so far had some limitations. Um, they were all based on horses working on the slat in the Olympic disciplines, in which it is considered correct for the front of the head to be in a vertical position. But I think that we can apply the ethogram to other horses as long as we exclude specific behaviors. So, for example, if we're looking at a reigning horse, we would exclude a very slow gait because they're trained to, to work like that. And we would, um, uh, and if we were looking at um, a jumping horse and a jumping horse approaching a fence, it may be above the bit, but that would be normal for it. We wouldn't count that. But under other circumstances, I think you could apply it under other circumstances. Um, obviously, this latter study had the potential for bias. It is, was obviously not possible to conceal the lameness, but remember that most of the assessors were not veterinarians and the lameness was low grade. Next slide, please. So in that study, each horse acted effectively as its own control. The only thing that changed was that we removed the pain. 
But there obviously are other potential factors which could be influential in the demonstration of behaviours. And I think that these include rider skill, rider weight, the fit of attack, and other pain, for example, gastric ulceration. With respect to rider skill, on the bottom, on the bottom left, we can see a rider who's sitting on the back of her saddle, her lower leg is too far forward, her upper body is inclined forward, she's got a very low hand carriage, and we can see that the horse is above the bit with its mouth open, the bit is coming through the mouth, and the horse doesn't look a very happy horse. In the middle picture, we've got a more skilled rider, and the horse has changed in its behavior. Now, instead of being above the bit, the front of the head is behind the vertical. Uh, the horse um, is tilting its head. It turned its tail swish, and it also showed the white of the eye. And it's only after we have removed the pain, as we see in the picture on the right, that we see the horse looking very much happier. Um, uh, with the front of the head in a vertical position, the ears being forward, the eye looking happy, and the horse no longer tail swishing. So rider skill can have an effect. Change of the rider to a better rider can change the behaviors, but if there is a lame horse, it will still show abnormal behavior. Likewise, if you've got an abnormally, uh, an abnormally fitting saddle that's causing pressure, then if you change the saddle, I would expect to see a change in the behavior. But if there is underlying lameness, I would still expect to see behavioral signs of pain. This fifth phase of the study provided additional evidence that eight or more behaviors is likely to reflect the presence of pain and that, once again, pain scores reduce after resolution of the pain, showing that pain is the cause of these behaviors. Next slide, please. But I think that we've also got evidence that training is required for accurate interpretation of the ethogram. Next slide, please. So the final study I want to describe to you um, asks the question, can veterinarians reliably apply a whole horse-ridden ethogram to differentiate between non-name and name horses based on live horse assessment of the behavior? And our objectives were to compare real-time application of the ridden horse ethogram with analysis of video recordings of the horse by an experienced trained assessor, because all of the previous uh, work had been done based on video recordings, and then to determine whether the veterinarians, after they had received preliminary training, could apply the ethogram in a consistent way and in agreement with the trained assessor. So 10 equine veterinarians underwent some preliminary training. They were delivered a PowerPoint uh, presentation with um, audio over the top, and then they had to assess and test horses and received um, uh, individual feedback about their performance on the test horses applying the ethogram. And then on the day... They had to apply the ethogram in a live setting to 20 volunteer horse rider combinations who performed a purpose-designed dressage test, which took 8.5 minutes, which was a preliminary standard. And these horses were um, volunteer horses who were in regular work and capable of being worked on the bit and were assumed by their owners to be non lane uh, we acquired video recordings of the entire test, which were analyzed retrospectively by the trained assessor several weeks after the test day. Before the uh, test was performed, um, the saddle fit was assessed by a qualified saddle fitter who was asked to say, could or could not the saddle potentially cause pain? Uh, the presence of back muscle tension or pain was determined by a skilled physiotherapist. Um, during the test, the presence of lameness or abnormalities of canter were assessed by um, uh, an independent expert, and rider skill level was determined by uh, another independent expert who was a British Horse Society instructor. Next slide, please. Of the 20 horses, actually 16 horses were lame or showed gait abnormalities in canter. Eleven were determined to have an ill-fitting saddle with the potential to influence performance. Fourteen had some degree of back muscle tension 
or pain with the potential to influence performance. And the rider's skill level was scored on the FEI scoring basis and ranged between 3 and 8 with an average of 5. Uh, next slide, please. So the trained assessor determined total scores of between 3 and 6 out of 24 for the non-lame horses. In addition, two of the lame horses had no scores. They scored 3 and 6. But the 14 other lame horses scored between 8 and 16. Next slide. No. And when we compare the um, scores for the real-time scores and the video-based scores, there were no significant differences for the trained assessor. Now, next slide, please. Uh, there was good agreement between the trained assessor's scores and the mean test observer's scores. Test advance, please. There was excellent consistency in the overall agreement amongst the assessors. Advance, please. Uh, and there were significant differences between the behavior scores um, uh, between, um, sorry, start again. Uh, there was a significant difference according to lameness status for both the real time and the video recordings for the trained assessors and for the uh, volunteer assessors. So they were significantly different. Uh, advance, please. And now we can see a graph. And the blue boxes represent the scores for the non-lame horses. On the left-hand side, we've got the live score. In the middle, we've got the video score. Um, and on the right-hand side, we've got the um, test observer scores. And we can see they're very similar. And likewise, for the green boxes, which represent the lame horses, we can see, again, they, they are pretty similar, although there's a greater variation amongst the um, test observers on the right-hand side. Uh, next slide, please. There was no statistically significant effect of rider skill level, the presence of back muscle pain, or an ill-fitting saddle on the horse behavior scores. So the horse behavior scores were, com were dominated by the presence or absence of um, lameness or gait abnormalities in canter. Next slide, please. So we concluded that the whole horse-ridden ethogram can be applied reliably in real time with excellent agreement with the retrospective video analysis. And it again provided further evidence that a cutoff of H behavioral markers uh, means that most lame horses can be differentiated from the non-lame horses. And the veterinarians were overwhelmed by the abil their ability to detect the presence of pain purely looking at behavior. They got very, very excited throughout the day. Uh, next slide, please. So I think you, we can conclude that even if a horse appears non-lame in hand, it may be lame when ridden, and this may be manifest by its behavior, which is an indicator that something is not right. Here are photographs of a horse competing at a uh, now five-star three-day event who is past a trot-up but clearly is looking very uncomfortable in both its trot and its canter work um, when warming up for the dressage phase. Next slide, please. Um, I do believe that there are some difficult horses which may show, for example, one behavioral sign, such as rearing. Uh, but I think that most horses which are labeled as naughty horses show numerous behavioral signs which are consistent with the presence of underlying pain. And I therefore believe that education of everybody involved in the equine industry is needed to recognize that these features are a reflection of pain, they're not just a horse being awkward or difficult. Next slide, please. So I think that it is unacceptable to say that these problems are training-related, rider-related, or behavioral, or that's just how the horse has always gone. In my experience, they are usually pain-induced, and I think it's very important that everybody involved 
uh, in the horse industry becomes aware of this. Next slide, please. So I have to give some acknowledgements. There are three key co-workers, Andrea Ellis from Unit Equine Limited, who did all the statistical analyses. Janine Berger is from uh, the USA. She is a behavioral expert and a veterinary welfare expert and also a horse person. And Jessica Mullard was uh, previously worked for me and was uh, heavily involved in the initial studies. And I also have to thank World Horse Welfare in particular for funding and from a contribution from the Saddle Research Trust. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Dyson. You, what you've done is you've quantified what so many skilled trainers and veterinarians have suspected for a long time, and that is many problem horses are actually in pain. This is a groundbreaking piece of work, I think, uh, and uh, at a critically important time for our industry. Normally on these calls, we um, hold questions until the end. Do, do you have time to spend about another 20 minutes while we finish the rest of the call? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. For, that's fine. For Sue, we can take them now, and if anybody doesn't want their question on the recording, if you can just let us know, and I can edit it out afterwards. That's okay. So, so if anyone has questions, um, you can unmute your line with uh, star six. Whilst they're waiting, I could comment that. Um, the American um, charity Equitopia are going to produce an educational video describing this work and describing how to apply the ethogram and the problems involved with its interpretation. And um, I think this is going to be a very thorough training course. We did three days of filming for it last week, and I hope that this will be out later this year. Excellent. Uh, it's, it's Dr. Bettina Bodstein here. I, I have a question, and that is, um, how do you feel that, or or do you feel that the use of over tightened, you know, crank uh, so-called crank nose bands, did that in, does that a cause pain in horses, and did that make interpretation of the ethogram more difficult, or interpretation of the horse's behavior more difficult? No, I would say absolutely not. Um, I haven't presented the work here, but we have looked at nose bands, and in fact, the crank nose band, the crank flash nose band. Um, inhibits the horse often from the opening its mouth as much as it would have done otherwise. So it's actually obscuring behavior rather than inducing behavior. Do we have any more questions? Star six to unmute your line. I suspect perhaps um, people are a bit overwhelmed in thinking about all those bad horses they've known. Bad horse Sorry, I was just going to ask a question. So, um, to just to be clear, so the combination of multiple behavioral signs is what leads you to um, come up with like a total score. Uh, how do you separate, you know, signs of relaxation or stress from because they can be somewhat similar to some of the signs that are described within the ethogram? So, what's how was that factored into consideration? Well, I think that many horses who are said to be stressy horses are, in fact, horses that are in discomfort. And if you take away their discomfort, they look very, very much more relaxed. Um, and I think that, uh, I, that that has previously probably gone insufficiently recognized. Thank you. I had a question as well. This is Kate. Um, thanks for your presentation. It's very interesting. I was just curious if you had any horses in the study that perhaps didn't um, actually, where their lameness did not resolve after the local blocks. And I'm wondering if there, um, if you've seen any, I guess, complicating factors, perhaps with like ovarian pain or gastric ulcer type pain. Um, um, if there was any involvement I think that would that be, yeah, I, I think that would be pretty unusual. The, whenever I'm faced with a situation when I think, oh, I think I've resolved the lameness, but the horse still shows some abnormalities of behavior, I always think, well, what else could be wrong here? Um, I always check the saddle. 
and I change the saddle if necessary to a better sitting saddle, and that's sometimes the problem. Um, there's sometimes just the very low grade lameness that I've missed that I can subsequently block out. Um, with respect to gastric ulceration, we have not looked specifically at gastric ulceration. But I can say that a lot of the horses that I look at have already had gastroscopy, ulcers have been identified, the horses have been treated with omeprazole, they've been rescoped, the ulcers have resolved, but the rider's problems have persisted. So clearly the problems exhibited by the horse um, were not associated with the ulcers. Um, but another phase of the study would certainly include looking at horses which have got ulcers before treatment and after treatment. But I think we will, unless they're completely sound horses, I think we will find that um, behaviours persist. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that's it for questions. Thank you again, Dr. Dyson, for just an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, next okay. up, we You're have very Christy welcome. House. Thank you. Next up, we have Christy House from Equine Canada to give us an update on strangle the strangles outbreak in New Brunswick. Uh, yep, thank you. So we, um, I just received an update from uh, Dr. Nicole Wanamaker from uh, the New Brunswick uh, Veterinary Office, and so she just provided us a brief update that, uh, and I'll just read it. Current status is that there were swabs taken on infected horses as per AEP guidelines. Since horses were in quarantine, a set of three swabs. All swabs have come back negative to date. Um, Systematic horses are, or symptomatic horses are still in an isolated area and will be for the foreseeable future due to the setup of the farm. No other horses on the farm have shown any new symptoms, um, and the quarantine has been listed on the farm. Um, she also said um, there is more information on the CAS website, so the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System. Um, and she will check the website in a few days to see if there's any other issues. So that's all I have from her, and um, we will just move on to the next agenda item. Shauna, Karen Cooper, uh, a review of the new 2019 equine medication control rule changes. Great. Hi, everybody. There you go. <laughs> Uh, so we did talk about some of these rules that they would be coming out on the last uh, call. So it is now have the release has now been sent out to Equestrian Canada sport license holders in both English and French. The updated equine medication control guide is available in both official languages on the Equestrian Canada website. So those are all uh, up to date. Um, so we've got. Uh, testing for biphosphonates uh, will be occurring this year. Now, we do have a little bit of a um, – we have two sets of uh, violations – or the – sorry. <laughs> we'll be um, phasing in some of the uh, sanctionings for this. So, if uh, a horse is uh, four and over and a medication control test comes back positive for – Clodonerate or telodronate, so Ospos or children. Um, if the horse is four and over, it is simply a, a published warning letter this year. Starting in 2020, so next season, it would be a class three violation. Uh, we are, we are going with the Canadian Paramutual Agency's uh, elimination guideline of 30 days. So you'll want to make sure that you are uh, adhering to that. Uh, for horses four and under, uh, Ospos and children are not permitted for use, and starting in 2019 and beyond, it is a, a Class 3 violation, so there's no grace period for horses four and under. Presence of any other biphosphonates, so they are not permitted. Any other biphosphonate is not permitted for use in horses in Canada, and that is automatically a Class 3 violation for 2019 and beyond. Um, so just a little bit of the phasing in for Ospos and children for horses four and over. Uh, medroxy progesterone we have upgraded to a class 
five violation this year. So that does come with a monetary penalty as well as publication on the website. Um, now we do recognize that there is a prolonged elimination period. So a subsequent infraction will not be issued within 30 days of the, of a prior infraction. So we know that we've got, um, show series that run for two to three weeks. If you get tested in week one, it's likely you'll be tested positive again in, in, if you get tested in week two. So we wouldn't issue a second class five. We know it takes a long time to, to eliminate from the horses. And then finally, the, uh, last is the new prohibited practice of same day, uh, administration of medications or substances by injection. So this one we do really want to, uh, reiterate that there is no same day injection of medication or substances to a horse on the same day as your class. Um, now we did mo model it after the FEI. So if your class is after 6 p.m., you can give a last injection, uh, what well, must be before 10 a.m. on the same day. Um, other than that, if you have a class starting any time before 6 p.m., there are no injections on the same day of competition. The only exception to this is IV rehydration fluids and antimicrobials. They must be administered by a licensed veterinarian and they must be given more than six hours before the start time of a class. So that is the only one that is that has a, a time limit there with the six hours. But other than that, um, just reiterating, no injections, same day as, as competition. And we're going to be releasing different um, different things throughout the season just to keep up to date. Any questions can be directed to equine med at equestrian.ca. Always helpful uh, when we have your questions in writing, or you can give me a call as well, but equine med at equestrian.ca is the email address. Um, and other than that, that's all we have. Excellent, Shauna. Thanks very much. It looks like um, you, you uh, are moving forward to protect welfare. Uh, uh, particularly in and around the biophosphate. That's really good to hear. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Do, do we have any more uh, questions, discussions, comments? Um, star six to mute or unmute your line or perhaps questions for Shauna or Christy? Uh, just while people are getting unmuted, I wanted to let everybody know that for the June call, um, we will have a representative from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency coming on to discuss the process for um, emergency or temporary vaccination import process. Um, so that's going to be very helpful for veterinarians to, who are looking to get uh, import permits for vaccinations into Canada, as well as we may have um, Dale Duma from Manitoba discussing um, equine and the plasma, I believe, but we have not confirmed that speaker. Uh, if anybody else is interested in providing a topic for the June meeting, please be sure to get a hold of me at least two weeks in advance of the call. Every call is the first Wednesday of each month unless uh, it's a holiday long weekend, and then we tend to push it to the second week. Um, the schedule for all the calls can be found on the website, as well as all the recordings and the agenda when they're posted. So I'd like to thank everybody for uh, uh, dialing uh, dialing in today and um, hearing the, the, the great presentation by Dr. Dyson. And we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you on the call next month.